Hey, welcome to today's program. I'm BIV reporter Tyler Orton, and uh, we have, a, I think, an important discussion to have right now. We've been doing this a lot more lately, and I think it's been a wake-up call for many businesses following the killing of George Floyd and what that has really brought to the forefront. And the realization that businesses need to be more inclusive. And our next guest is launching a new company that aims to help out with that. And I'd like to welcome to the show, Tammy Tsang. She is co-founder of the And Humanity Marketing Agency. And Tammy, I wanna thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me on, Tyler. So you guys are just launching this uh, as a new company. It's been in the works, I understand, for a little while. But um, before we jump into that, maybe tell me and our listeners, you know, what is the problem? What, what is the issue that you guys are trying to address right now? Right now, what we're finding is that a lot of companies are getting called out. And it's it's mostly because the organization is posting initially, you know, that black square that talks about Black Lives Matter, and it's in solidarity with it. And they're getting called out because they're not actually being diverse or inclusive in their practices internally, as well as externally. Um, and if you want to be a diverse and inclusive organization, you have to do both. It's not one or the other. It's everything that you do has to be diverse and inclusive. Yeah, one of the things I'm wondering is, are too many companies just kind of giving themselves a pat on the back where they're not actually doing much to really showcase that? I, I, I don't know, I, I don't wanna call out any particular candle companies, but uh, mm -hmm. there were some stories about how there's a lot of hypocrisy going on with some Vancouver businesses, but does more tangible items need to be showcased by these companies rather than just some of these symbolic gestures that are being made? Completely. And um, I mean, there's tons of articles written about it, but uh, there's a lot of these diversity and inclusion officers or, you know, a one time workshop that's being done. But diversity and inclusion is a and to be an authentic ally is an ongoing uh, commitment for an organization to um, constantly build authentic allies with these diverse communities, but also commit to the work uh, on a regular basis. Um, so unfortunately, these businesses are seeing it as kind of a checkbox instead of actually integrated into the values of their organization. And, and so what happens to these companies and their brand if they just kind of come off as insincere? I, I see that there is some backlash going on across you know, business communities all over the globe right now. Well, the thing is, they're they're missing the boat. Um, they're actually forgetting or not realizing what the business case is for it. Of course, there's the business case and there's the humanity case. Um, the business case is that by 2036, Canada is going to be a minority majority country, meaning that in 16 years, the entire country will mostly consist of BIPOC folk. Um, and in addition, what we know is that 70% of millennials and Gen Zs are willing to choose one brand over another based on the fact that they show diversity in their promotions. Uh, we know that the LGBTQ2 plus community is growing everywhere every year because people are self-identifying. Uh, we know that the aging population and their abilities are changing as the years go on. Um, so the diversity in our population needs to be reflected in the communication that you do, but also within your workplace. If you don't see that that's happening, you're really missing the boat and you're going to fall behind. Yeah, I had an interesting conversation earlier this week with an, a recruitment expert, and she was talking about how, look, maybe some companies could pat themselves on the back. You know, they, they've struck a committee to tackle diversity, and maybe they put, you know, people of color on that committee. But she says that risks a lot of tokenization uh, oh, and really? the way that those people feel. I, I'm wondering, you know, how do companies kind of go about this? They might have a lot of blinders on, just some unconscious biases that they might not realize. How do they go about doing this, even if they're coming at it kind of blind at this point? Well, the, uh, I think with every problem, what the first thing you need to do is identify exactly where you're at and assess the situation. And in order to do that, you need to really do a proper assessment of your organization uh, internally and externally in everything that you're doing. Um, so my organization, in collaboration with diversity and inclusion experts, actually created a brand inclusion framework. Um, and this is based off of work from Bennett's uh, developmental model of intercultural sensitivity, as well as work from TWI Inc. and ODR Inc. And what this does is actually it takes uh, a model of inclusion 
um, and actually looks at it in terms of a brand overall. So what this tool, we've created a self-assessment tool so you can actually take a eight minute kind of self-assessment test. And it'll tell you exactly where you fall on the curve. Unfortunately, people think you're either inclusive or you're not, but it's actually an ongoing curve that you have to climb up. And this test will actually tell you where you land, what your blind spot, or sorry, what maybe um, some of the gaps are in your diversity inclusion, and then tell you the next steps you're supposed to take. Yeah, would you be able to give me kind of an example of one of those questions that somebody might have to answer in a, a tool or an assessment like this? Yes, of course. So, for example, one of the questions we ask is that whether or not your marketing and communication actually reflects the diversity of your customer mix. So, for example, are you aware of how many uh, BIPOC folk are actually in your customer base? And is that reflected in the same percentage of, how, of the people that you use to reflect your promotions or your advertisements? And I, I think that's interesting because, I, of course, I, I think we all understand the humanity issue that you brought up either. And, and if we tackle the business issue, a lot of companies could be leaving a lot of money on the table if they don't actually wake up to this and make sure that they're getting their brand out there, they're getting their message out there that accurately reflects who their market is as well. Mm -hmm, completely. And I, I'm glad you brought up the humanity case because I, I think what people don't realize is that how much representation matters. Just how much? Because, uh, this, for example, there's a study by University of Michigan that talks about how um, or did a study that showed about 400 kids, seven to 12 years old, who over a span of a year was exposed to media and they studied from the very beginning to the very end and they found that the white kids were actually much more confident than the black kids. We also know that Jane Elliott, uh, who did an experiment with her classroom in 1968, who showed that just within a span of one day, um, the kids that were seen as more privileged, which she chose either the brown eyed kids or the blue eyed kids, depending on the day, um, actually perform better in tests. So we know that this impact it actually impacts individuals on a regular basis, on an everyday basis. It's almost as if, you know, if I never see anybody out there being promoted that um, reflects who I am, um, I don't know if that's a possibility for me. Is that what we're kind of getting from younger you know, generations, those, you know, sense of confidence that you mentioned? Yes, it's, it's just showing yourself reflected um, in a way that's actually of, you know, not in a stereotypical way, in an authentic way, and in the complex intersection, which is, you know, I'm a woman who is second generation Canadian, like being reflected in that complex manner in maybe a position of power. For example, if you don't get to see yourself reflected in that way, it's very hard to imagine yourself ever being in a position like that. You know, I, I think maybe a lot of Canadians, they'd like to think that, you know, things are getting better year by year. I, I wonder, though, I, it's an issue that we, we've been talking about on the periphery for a long time. Do you get the sense just in the last two months, though, that people are waking up that there will be some like actual solid fundamental change just moving forward with, with some different realizations that uh, businesses as well as society at large are having right now? I really hope so. Um, um... I think that there is a wake up call. A lot of people are starting to learn and read about it, but there needs to be ongoing commitment. And that's what authentic allyship is. It's ongoing, dedicated commitment over many, many, many years, because this is not, you know, an overnight job. It's, it's a long term, uh, self-reflective self, -reflective, self um, relearning all the things that you grew up with and really understanding what it means to be truly empathetic, to have cultural competence. Um, so I really hope so. I hope that organizations see this. And the reality is that if you're not there in say 10 years, you're also going to be left behind. So um, it'll be kind of a double-edged sword in that way. Well, from what you guys are doing as well, I, I'm curious about that. Uh, from what I understand that you guys are, you know, uh, tapping some experts, some advisors that can help mm -hmm. you with this. Tell me a little bit about how that's going to go and, and what insights that's going to give you as well as any of uh, the potential clients that you guys would be working with. 
Well, first of all, what we're noticing in our industry is that a lot of marketers who are doing the wonderful inclusion uh, work in marketing and communications is great, but a lot of it isn't actually informed by diversity and inclusion experts. And the problem with that is that then you're not actually applying real theory behind it. You're kind of working from personal experience. Um, and that's where you get some of the mistakes that are made um, and the backlash from that. The diversity inclusion specialists keep us accountable to ensure that everything we do is, uh, there's a saying, nothing about us without us, that we're constantly asking and respecting the community that we are reflecting in our marketing and communications. They also are part of the process along the way to ensure that these allyships are authentic and um, mutually beneficial, um, that we're constantly thinking of the needs of the community that we're serving uh, in the messages that we're, we portray. Um, these individuals are high, highly um, attuned with the change that needs to happen within an organization as well, because it's, it's a very personal journey as much as it is a brand journey. Um, it, it, it can't change without the people themselves in the organization really doing a lot of self-reflection. So in terms of organizations that might be, you know, best suited to tackle this issue right away, I, I'm wondering, like, large organizations, they often have the resources and the wherewithal to deploy this, but often it could be like trying to turn around a cruise ship versus trying to turn around a speedboat. I, I'm wondering what you're noticing with large organizations versus small organizations and their willingness to address these issues about inclusivity. Well, some of these large organizations are really doing a fantastic job. And uh, of course, there's uh, there isn't anyone on the curve who's perfect. Let's just put it that way. We all make mistakes and it's what you do with the mistakes that really matter. Um, there, as long as the, the leadership truly embodies these values and they're actually reflecting it and committing to the work, you can actually see a lot of change happen within an organization in a very short period of time. Um, of course, um, that needs to come from the leadership and needs to be genuine within the organization itself. Um, but as one of our diversity and inclusion specialists, um, Emil Reddy says, is that every step is a step towards being inclusive. Um, and that's all that really matters is that you're always taking these steps to move towards it. Because um, one of my former advisors said, how do you eat an elephant? You know, one bite at a time. Yeah, I would not want to try that all at once uh, for myself, <laughs> no. of course. Um, I, I'm curious, you know, you look at a city like Vancouver, it's known for its diversity. Uh, we've been talking about this a lot in the newsroom though, but you know, how much is that diversity reflected within the business community? Is there too much segmentation going on in certain businesses, certain industries, for example? What's your overall assessment about the way that Vancouver is tackling this issue versus maybe other jurisdictions that you may have noticed? Well, what's really interesting is that Canada in general is a very polite country. Um, uh, I, I follow a account called um, Black in, at UBC, and unfortunately, it's an account that's calling out UBC and the microaggressions that are happening there right now. And one of the posts um, talks about how um, because Canada and Vancouver is quite a polite city, um, the racism actually comes in the form of constant microaggressions that are happening on a daily basis. And um, it's happening not only between students at UBC or individuals in Vancouver, it's happening in you know, the workplace um, on a regular basis. And so the style or what we're seeing when it comes to um, uh, the lack of diversity or inclusion, it's that we're diverse, but we're not being inclusive. Does that make sense? Diversity yeah. is being invited to the dance and the tokenism part, and then inclusion is actually asking them to be there. What we're actually trying to get to is belonging, where you can, um, the analogy is that you can dance as if no one is watching. Um, so the idea here is that Vancouver needs to move from tokenism to inclusion and then eventually belonging. Um, and we're missing that piece here. Well, I, I really appreciate the time that uh, you've offered us today and also just the efforts that you and, and humanity are pursuing right now. And so, Tammy, I, I just want to thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you so much, Tyler, for having me here and giving us the space to share this information. Well, that's Tammy Tsang. She is the co-founder of And Humanity. And that's it for the show today, but we will be back soon enough. In the meantime, go to BIV.com, more interviews, more 
stories as well, uh, all the videos that you ever need, uh, just go to our websites. But in the meantime, I want to thank everybody for joining us on the show today.